All right, let's return to the book of Galatians, the first chapter, six verse. Talking about breaking the spell. You know, we often get caught up in something. We look back at the older we become and we say, what was I thinking? Well, usually we weren't thinking. We were caught up in feeling, influences, peer pressures, societal norms, uh, conformity to the culture. Like when I speak, it's so slow and you can tell I'm from Arkansas. And I'm old enough to remember when we spelled it, the end last, it was S-A-W, not S-A-S, because for the life of me, I didn't understand how can you spell Arkansas with S-A-S on the end. But again, it took time, but I'll never recover from what's happened to me in my lifetime. Those who presume they can didn't have anything happen to them. So uh, it is a remarkable experience, however. But looking back, you think, well, looking forward where we are, we break the spell for people. We see people, they're misled by hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is the weaponized or is the weapon of those in social navigation and maneuvering, manipulation. Deuteronomy 21:22 says, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death and he be put to death and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, I reference that as we go into Galatians, and you're in the first chapter there, because even in his death, Jesus fulfilled the law. You notice that? Do you hear that? He was hanged on a tree, and notice the Romans at that time had begun to... Um, have friction between themselves and later the Jewish wars would outbreak. But at this time, they were still accommodating to establish religion. So some have said, well, they wanted to take Jesus down because after all, they were that polite or something. But, but Galatians 4.4 4 said, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Adoption is the son place, that position, that according to the Bible is in the ecclesia, the Father's house here and now, and in the resurrection, it is the, oh well, and in the uh, end of time, the return of Christ, it's the resurrection of our body, the redemption of our body. So let's break the spell, shall we? First John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits where they are of God because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You hear the clue there? False prophets. The spirit he's speaking of is a term that refers to a category that also at times includes mind. But then also mind and spirit can sometimes be categories which include one or the other. So that's not difficult to understand that this is referring to teaching. Dr. David Harris, one of the writers of your literature, uh, had once spoken of a text, this text particularly, saying it refers to teachings. Well, of course, we have a false prophet, a pseudo-prophet, who's out uh, marketing his message, if you will, merchandising men, commercializing Christ, modifying the message, exasperating God's sheep. That's, that's all they have. It's really all they do. And, and Jesus even said that the evil servant will say in his heart, the Lord delays his coming. So since we have time, what would they do? Well, it says he would begin to drink and beat the faithful servant. Then you hear what I said? They're intoxicated by abuse of people. Now you already know this. Organizations all over our world and especially in our country were advocates for this type of abuse, child abuse or domestic abuse or abuse by a spouse or all the types of things that we are familiar with. So what is about this urge that compels people? Well, it's a judgment because when you're turned over away from God, when the mind of a person decides it's no longer worthy to retain the full knowledge of God in it, God turns that mind of that person over to an unworthy mind. He lets go of the reins. Now, we have the sword of the stake. God doesn't release them so that they can wreak havoc, but He releases them so that we can notice God's judgment. And it's a good thing to be afraid of. But let's notice this spirit here. It's that disposition or influence which fills and governs the soul of anyone. The rational spirit, the power by which the human being feels, thinks, and decides. So Galatians 5.8 said this persuasion, this influence by these who were marketing a different kind of message... He said, it, here he said, 
is not of him that calleth you. So who called us? The Father of Jesus Christ called us in an unmerited favor from Christ. You notice how the Godhead in their omnific symbiosis, their relationship, the triunity, the word trinity, that harmonious relationship between them. That the Father who so loved sent the Son, the Son who was so obedient, so beloved, that He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So you, you hear, we're about to break this spell. We're trying these spirits. We're looking at these mental constructs. And are they not influential? Did you notice that? Even what we call a mental construct, those things become so influential that people begin to judge one another based on your valuation of or devaluation of a particular construct that they've happened to appropriate unto themselves and then at times even weaponize it for social advantages. And what do we know from our childhood? We were taught about this social maneuver where even people compete for resources at the expense of others. Uh, at one time it was called social Darwinism. That's striking that we would be so lewd and base that we would not love our neighbor as ourselves because we might not be loving God with all of our heart as we should. So he says here in Galatians 1 6, I marvel. He said, I'm in a process of marveling, ongoing, he said, that you're so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. I mean, it doesn't save anybody, it doesn't deliver anybody it doesn't result in redemption it doesn't herald the finished work of Christ the perfect work of Christ it doesn't even announce the need and the reason for it it nullifies the purpose of the law in the first place he said which is not another but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ but though we are an angel from heaven preaching any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed I mean let him incur this curse that comes from the law as we said there before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than you have received, let him be accursed. You know, when the Lamb Selection Day, I mentioned that and I'll mention it often, but when the Father would go out with the Son and find this particular Lamb, they placed it in a cage. And in that condition of being caged, it was considered anathematized. It's now set apart, ready to be offered up. And people would notice it. But the last thing on the mind of those who were of the law, doers, as we'll read that text in a moment and reference it last week, the last thing that would be on your mind was yourself. It would be about the one that this lamb represents who would come. As John the Baptist preacher said, behold, notice the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the great sin bearer. So we're not the sin bearer. Isn't that striking that people talk as if they can bear their own sins? Remember how flippant people are. How when it comes to what God says, uh, there's not much fear and reverence there. You remember when it comes to respect, it comes to a covenant, it comes to a reciprocal love, a reciprocal cause of base and gladness, a reciprocal long-suffering, a gentleness, a goodness, a meekness, a temperance, and a faith that reciprocates. And even in the fields of social science, they are studying now the predicament people are in who enter a covenant in good faith. Do you hear that? They take something as gracious as a covenant, these who are deceivers, and take the person into the covenant, and by that person's willingness to enter in good faith the covenant, they advantage themselves over that person. He said in Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, he, persuade means to influence, and He's certainly not trying to persuade God. That is, make a case for Christ to God because he said to the church in Corinth, he said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade all men. We go out and persuade men. We make a case for Christ to men. And the word persuade is influence them. Now you notice what others do. They dissuade them. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've reached someone and was serving the interest of Christ in so doing and discipling that person so they'd become a disciple for Christ and someone come and take them away for their own purposes. Yeah, and they were so good at it that they would actually dole out rewards at the church's expense and the people would then be ingratiated to them so much so that they still share sentimental communications during the holidays. 
But they don't write back and say, oh, I just wanted to let you know how thankful I was that you came and visited and initiated the relationship and led me to Christ, that is, to the ecclesia there at Landmark, and you set me on the path to becoming someone who would grow up to the full measure and the stature of Christ, be conformed to His... No, 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 no. No, this was just a stepping stone for them to be recruited, persuaded, otherwise influenced for the interest of something much less than Christ. You remember, Adam says... We were naked. We were hiding. And God said, what? The most gracious thing you've ever heard. Who told you that? Break that spell. Wait a minute. You ever talk to your children about someone unduly or negatively influencing them? I watched my dad. He would just, oh, lose his mind. Of course, being the older brother, I couldn't be caught up in the spell. And that's why people like myself and you all who are out of the darkness and are not under the spell and not subject to the dissuasions and negative influences. Uh, sometimes people don't want to be around the one of sobriety and wisdom, the one that's willing to mercy by the grace of God rather than measure by the law of Moses. It's like they want to avoid the light because they prefer their works which are evil and they don't want to come to the light. But there's no life in the darkness. Watch parents lose their minds over a rebellious child who almost gratifies themselves in their defiance. And I watched a, a man like my father, a genius, a man who could do things the scope and scale of which would have taken five other men to even attempt it. And then I watched one little person go along with his order. But it's hard to influence people who aren't impressed with something so base and lewd. Amen? Let's look at the math for a moment. Because, you know, we're breaking a spell. We're trying to be sober, have a clear mind. And no one likes math. You'll hear people say, you know why? Because it doesn't allow you to think the way you think. It, it scripts us. It formats our mind. You remember we used to have floppy disk. You'd have to format it because it had no particular format in it to store the data so that you could retrieve it. Well, think about people uh, with a mind that's not formatted. Think about it. It's not mathological. It's pathological. It's not the cognitive. It's the affective side. And that's why the Bible teaches us. Read Proverbs. 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 Actions. Proactions. Which is not what that word means. I'm just using the English to show you that it's not a good book for reactions. It, you hear that? It's not a good book for reactions. It's a good for, book for proactions. I, I'm good at warning my children to avoid certain people. I'm better at that than trying to recover him them from those people and the adverse negative effects they'll have on them. So it says in James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Now stop right there for a moment. 613 law codes, relationship to God and our neighbor. 253 in relationship to physiology and anatomy of man. 360 negative laws for each day of the year. Heart, soul, mind, body, and strength in relationship to God, heart, soul, mind, body, strength in relationship to the neighbor. One infraction in any one of those, like I said, I'm a two to three a day. And you have to add the fourth one because I just lied because it's, it's absurd. Well, the whole point of it, there has to be a point to this futility of the law. It's not a designed instrument that generates futility, and we'll see in a moment. But think about that. Who, who, would, who would even be able to persuade people but for those being ignorant of the scope and scale of the law and its infinite expectations and demands. And there's only one person, Isaiah 42, chosen, who's willing and able to fulfill it, not just keep it, fulfill it. In all of those 10 features in relationship to God and relationship to the neighbor. There's only one person who's obedient unto death, even that particular kind of death of the cross, Jesus Christ. So we're not the person. So sober up. We're not Jesus. Oh, well, that's obvious. Well, you need to slow down when you're around some of them. It's like, so you're, you're trying to compensate for something you perceive lacking in the finished work of Christ? Well, no, I, that don't sound right, does it? No, no, it doesn't sound right. What made the event of the cross so trivial that it's a subject matter for other people's speculation? When you have that flippant attitude toward the cross, you have no idea... You have never seen the cross of Christ. It says, For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy, James 
and mercy rejoices against judgment. Do you mind if I word that out for a minute? He says, he will cause the judgment without mercy. Now, I don't want judgment without mercy, but it says he will cause the judgment without mercy to the one who did not cause mercy. You know, I've watched people, especially religious people, well, political, but I was focusing on religious people, almost uh, uh, heightened in their zeal when they saw the help being removed. And as there'd be less and less help, they would exult and just vaunt themselves and be in a stupefied state of inebriation. It says here that they'll have a he will cause the judgment without mercy for the one who did not cause mercy. Indeed, he will wish, the one that denied mercy, notice this, he will wish for a mercy within the purview of judgment. You know, today we had an episode in a classroom involved my favorite granddaughter, the beautiful 12-year-old granddaughter. I responded first because a lot more mercy in my pocket, you might say. So I go in, she's negotiating because she knows she has a judgment here that's negotiable. And while I was doing it, the door opened. I looked behind me and there was her father. And I just stepped out and watched her receive a judgment without mercy. And she was wishing for Papa to come back to the room. You say, well, that's funny. Well, no, it's just, it's just so self-evident. And you notice those who would deny mercy by the grace of God, that mercy that's only by the grace of God, that help that's only by the favor that comes from God as He exerts His holy influence to make the difference that we can't make. And we extend the help that they can't. And someone said, well, I don't think we ought to help people who can't help themselves or won't help themselves. Well, listen, welcome to the mirror of life if you continue to say of yourself that you're a person who's always there to help yourself. Really? What about your life when you couldn't help yourself? When was that, Brother Carter? When you saw the cross of Jesus Christ and found that He died because of your sins. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy, help, and good fruit, without partiality. Oh, there's that partiality thing. Don't we love to do things for our friends? You know, the ones that deserve it. And without hypocrisy. Oh, I know, I'm like y'all, you cringe when you see that word. Hypocrisy, pretense, the power of ignorance. You all remember we were taught as we were growing up, there's power, knowledge is power. I mean, if you answer to the stakeholder, it is. You know, like I'd be in meetings and notice that, oh, you do value the knowledge that you gave me through the training and subject matter expertise and specialized knowledge that was acquired through structure and discipline. Well, the rest of them could just leave the room. But what about this power of ignorance? Here's a question. Do you measure others by the law of Moses or mercy to them by the grace of God? Jesus said, the way you measure, it'll be measured unto you. Now, I've been around some strange people because it was so perplexing to me that they would be measuring so inconsistently with that which Jesus had just said and not realize the backfire effect of all the numerous things they now have brought themselves under the liability of. But I'll quote what I've said often before, and usually I teach a class in the summers. For a few years I did, and it was about instant experts and false authorities. It says there are such remarkable people. They get so great a return of conclusion from the most trifling input of fact. I mean, they just, it's not even a word anymore. It's just a sound they make. It's how empty it is. But here's the major thesis. I remind you, Galatians 6, 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. It's always to take the pressure off of them and let's move it over here to these people so it'll amplify and increase on them. Just as Jesus said, they lay grievous burdens upon others but won't lift a finger. Here, these churches are being influenced and shown a way to relieve the pressure of moving on as the law it taught and instructed and as the accomplished, finished work of Christ has now expected and graciously found the Father calling people out from that favor from Jesus Christ to come out and enjoy all these blessings there and to appertaining in this worship in the ecclesia. It's like inviting a sheep to a flock under the headship of the shepherd and all the benefits. 
and the green grass and the still water. And these people who are competing, the hirelings, don't appreciate this. Because, you know, our market is diminished when people exit. You remember the story of Egypt. The, them, the premise of Egyptianity is, who is God that we should obey Him? I mean, that's what Pharaoh asked. It was a good question, wasn't it? And who answered it? Well, God answered it. <laughs> and you remember, the man was so puny as any finite, fallen, mutable man would be that God would have to go to his corner to strengthen it. That word hardened, strengthen, encourage this man. You think of how funny that would be if someone placed that into one of those movies we watch and, and had some character playing God and over there in the corner with a towel and trying to open his eye. And oh, Pharaoh says, cut me. Let me see. And he, God has to get him up for the next round. Unless you know of a human that could go ten rounds with the all-powerful God. Isn't it a funny story? I call him Barney Pharaoh. Barney Pharaoh. If you learned the lesson, you would too. Nothing about Pharaoh. And there he was, raised up from the Egyptians to be postured so God could show the praise of His glory. And here's Moses who wasn't born in that bondage typifying Christ who wasn't born in our bondage and enslavement. And he was sent back into Egypt to bring his people out. But here it says, for neither they, that, neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. Now here, do you love that? Well, give me an example. I, I've, I've run into it thousands of times. People come up, tout something. You ever heard someone tout their preferred translation, but you notice the way they're behaving, they must not have read it. I mean, how difficult is it to do that? Because those of us that actually use the Bible, especially this English Bible, this last Bible that was composed and amended and refined by God using men. I'm not talking about machines and techno-gadgetry today. This one that had blood on it from martyrs and persecutions and pressures and political tyrants and religious maniacs. Isn't it remarkable that someone would take it and weaponize it to diminish someone else? Well, that's what's here. This is the power of ignorance. See, if you're not careful, you'll think that when someone says circumcision, see, they, they pick one, circumcision, and they can feign themselves a keeper of all. Look at the math again. And this will let you know that they couldn't possibly be this smart. This lets us know that there is another one involved, another spirit involved in this dissuasion from these churches in Galatia. From, from these, uh, these, these uh, congregations, ecclesias, away from their good shepherd. To turn away from his finished work and the purpose for which all the law was given in the first place. It says in James 2, again, remember this, offend in one point, you're guilty of all. These religious people say, circumcise, and they want you to think, they're keepers of all. Tell one law, feign yourself a keeper of all. And you say, wait a minute, I don't understand. Uh, I don't want to bother people who go around pretending there's something. No, 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 we don't. They're the ones that have the addiction problem. They're the ones that can't seem to be accommodating for sheep eating green grass and enjoying still waters. Following Christ, you remember the maniacal Caesars would put you to death if they heard you were baptized into Christ. If you didn't say Kaiser Kyrios, Caesar's Lord, and you were saying Christo Kyrios, Jesus Christ is Lord, there's only room for one Lord in Rome. But let's go on. It says here, Hebrews 10, 28, He that despises Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. That word despise means negate the position of the law. What was the position? Well, they were now taking that which was a means to the end. It was instructional. And they were, going to, they were taking it now to use it for themselves to say that their performance according to it has now demonstrated their own establishment of righteousness. Moses and his bring them to Christ the law. Let's read Acts 13, 39. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. You couldn't be justified by the law of Moses. But by Jesus you can be justified. But not by the law of Moses. Do you hear that? Now, I've run across religious people and they're really confused and it's nothing to belittle people about. I mercy them, tell them the truth. Now, you'll take a, uh, sometimes a negative reaction from them, but if you don't 
hurry up and speak the truth in the moment you have, you won't be able to get there in time. I'm, fin I'm usually finished helping someone that is giving them mercy by the grace of God before they even realize what's happening because I want to do that first. Some of you in the medical profession know that you go ahead and treat what you know is wrong first. And then maybe a week later when you go in and check on them in their recovery condition, you can chat about things. But immediately, let's take what's at hand. So we mercy first. We don't measure. And we mercy by the grace of God. We don't measure by the law of Moses. But these folks have invented new standards that would be less than the inspired standard, which is the law of God. Supposing now that they just create their own hurdles and their own hoops, and if they can jump it and go through it, somehow they can say, and what's that called? We justified ourselves. And then they spend the rest of their lifetimes preoccupied with telling others they should jump their hurdle and go through their hoop, and it's all vain. It's all vain. Law and grace. So there's one schoolmaster. There's one who instructs us. That's the law. And the other influences us. Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. That's the merciful kindness by which God, exerting His holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of the Christian virtue. So there's nothing uh, virtuous about us that's not that's originated from our flesh. Even the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit that I referenced earlier, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the meekness, the temperance of faith, that's of the Spirit. We, we no more conjure that. Especially when we notice the world's versions are perversions and they never reciprocate. He goes on and says, grace is, so here, grace is the influence and Jesus is the influencer. So we get that. Galatians 3, 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And now they're using it to not go to Christ. It, it couldn't be more opposite. Notice the math was totally inverted. Guilty, uh, uh, offend in one point, you're guilty of all, but they're, pre they're pretending that they can take, pick one thing, circumcision, and be a keeper of all. You know they're not that smart, right? He says... But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now you notice it said under law and under grace. We're not under law, we're under grace, speaking of those things as they stand. And now he speaks of the schoolmaster personifying the law and the grace referring to Jesus Christ. Romans 2.13, you'll love this. We all do. All of us love it. Because the law is the schoolmaster, then the students of it will trust Christ. Or as Jesus said, the one who listens alongside from the Father, that is, is learning, will come to Him. Romans 2.13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. What's that word doer? You ready? It's beautiful. It's poems. The poems of the law. Paul said in Ephesians 2.10, Workmanship. He said, we, plural, are his workmanship, singular. That's the word for a thing, a thing, a neutral term. This one in Romans is a masculine term referring to people. So the poems of the law. And in Corinthians, he said in 3, 3, 2 Corinthians, for as much as you are manifestly declared to, the, to, to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So he just said, poems are the product of an author. How can someone say that they respect the law, which was a schoolmaster, but they didn't follow the lesson as a student of it? He said in John 5, 46, for had you believed Moses, but you didn't, you would have believed me, but you won't. For he wrote of me, now, is that not the ultimate contradiction for Moses to write concerning Jesus and people prefer to say they're Moses and then fake it up as they go, I mean, make it up as they go along? Did you hear that? The power of ignorance, the audacity of a merciless mind, a disgraceful heart. John 8, 39, they answered and said unto him, Abraham's our father. That's enough said, is it not? Abraham's our father. But Jesus said, you remember, he always wants to mercy people with his grace. 
He said, if you were Abraham's children, but you're not, you would do the works of Abraham, but you won't. What were they doing? Trying to kill Jesus. Now, isn't that, isn't that interesting how much of a spell and how severely deluded you can become? So deluded that you can be out walking about touting Moses who instructed you to trust Jesus because he wrote of Jesus and touting Abraham, the one who longed to see Jesus' day, and you're out trying to kill Jesus and you refuse to believe in Jesus. Luke 12, 1 says, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Isn't it striking that hypocrisy is what we find at the heart, the root of all the fruit? Uh, rather than love, it's hate. Rather than joy, it's what? No cause of gladness. Matter of fact, if you notice the term Paul said he agonized the good agony, they anti-agonize they anti it. You get up and announce that you reach someone for Christ, they're like, oh, we better keep an eye on that. What? <laughs> what do you mean keep an eye on that? Well, that may get out of control. Whose control? Theirs. What controls that? I don't know. It's presumption to suppose that they could withstand the living God. But Stephen said just before they killed him that they do always resist the Holy Spirit. This is a spirit problem. James wrote that if you have dead faith, that's inert faith. It's a love problem because the Bible says faith, according to the Bible, faith that we receive through persuasion and we have that faith and we exercise by trusting Jesus Christ for everlasting life. It says that faith works for itself through love. So you have a love problem. If you have a problem being faithful, it's a love problem, not a faith problem. That was the whole point James made. The whole purpose of the book is to go out and mercy people by the grace of God. Amen. Aren't you thankful we can break that spell? Others say, I don't want to bother people about their beliefs. Really? Well, you're okay with them dying without mercy under the law? You're okay with them not having mercy by the grace of God? You want them to be inflicted by the measure they've applied to others and now don't even realize it has a backfire effect of exponential returns? You go out and do that and you get all the law right back on you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now so grateful for this day and we're so thankful that we're not under the spell and disillusionment that somehow you failed to accomplish everything you intended in and by your Son, Jesus Christ. For your word says that you were in your Son, Jesus Christ, reconciling the world unto yourself. We're so thankful you didn't count our sins and trespasses against us. We're so thankful that Moses and the prophets that you sent, that we have today in our scriptures, speak of your Son, Jesus Christ, and Him exclusively. Thank you for loving us and calling us by that favor from your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for teaching us to go out and mercy others by your grace. And thank you for warning us and even causing us to fear that we would dare measure another by the law of Moses. Thank you that it's so clear it's either mercy or Moses. It's grace or law. It's love or it's hypocrisy. And Father, for this good news, this gracious news that you've done so much for us by exerting your holy influence, that which we call grace, that which we know is the favors you do for us. And for the times you've mercied us and helped us, it was when we couldn't help ourselves. And when we could help ourselves, you mercied us and we became those who enjoyed being abundantly supplied. You were so helpful, full of help, full of mercy. Father, for this congregation, thank you for carving us out and calling us out from this world that we might be here at your son's table, giving you all the glory, assuring that that's by him and that's in this ecclesia. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.